you're so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. The last couple of days has seen the Ukrainian military launch a major strategic operation east of Kharkiv that is undoubtedly their most successful uh, military operation so far in the war, and one that has resulted in what cannot be described in any other terms than a, a rout, a complete rout of the Russian army east of Kharkiv. So I'm going to describe what's going on right now and how it came to this. Uh, because this has been uh, an operation in the making for pretty much since the start of the war. Uh, so let's understand kind of the, the background to this. Um, so when I say rout, I mean, uh, th this isn't the first time the Russian army has been defeated this war. I mean, the Battle of Kiev, uh, and basically the battle for northern Ukraine was won by Ukraine uh, back in late March. Uh, but I wouldn't call that a rout. Um, the... The Ukrainians did score in some important victories in, in a counterattack in the outskirts of Kiev that eventually drove them back further, drove the Russians back further. Um, but the Russians really were just completely, uh, just had their arms tied behind their back because of their logistical problems. They could not advance. They were not willing to risk an all-out assault on on the capital, and so they took the strategic decision to leave northern Ukraine altogether. Um, so I would, that's why I wouldn't call it a rout, uh, because it was essentially a decision that was taken that it was better for them to just concentrate their forces on a more limited objective, which was the Donbass. Uh, and that way they could at least claim, if, if they are successful in the Donbass, they could at least claim, uh, some semblance of victory because, uh, it became obvious after the first couple of weeks that their original war objectives were not going to be able to be achieved. So the complete occupation of Ukraine, the uh, the collapse of the Zelensky government, the uh, denazification uh, of Ukraine, uh, none of that. That was off the table in a matter of weeks. So try and secure a, a, a minor victory by conquering the Donbass and, and maybe setting up a land corridor with, with Crimea. That became the, uh, the, the secondary objectives from April onward. Now, since then, the Russian army has been on the offensive in the Donbass. I mean, there were months and months of, of just relentless push uh, with everything they had. Uh, this was attrition warfare of, of the worst, uh, basically resembling World War I more than anything else. And the Ukrainian army uh, had to trade territory for, for time, as they have been since the start of the war. Ukrainian military suffered some significant losses, I would say. I mean, there was a time that Zelensky himself admitted that something more like 100, 200 uh, Ukrainians were dying a day, which is uh, a casualty rate that you don't want to sustain in the longer run. And obviously the Russians were losing more, but still, this is uh, uh, this was tough. I, I, I think that when, uh, when a lot of Ukrainian soldiers look back on the war, they're going to think that that Donbass offensive was the worst for them. Uh, just because of the type of warfare that they were being uh, subjected to. Um, that was probably the worst that they will have seen. Um, but eventually, the uh, the Russian army just ran out of steam. Um, I've read some pieces that, that uh, describe this type of warfare as a, the war of, of corrosion, and it makes a lot of sense. And at the beginning of the war, I remember in one of my videos, or one of my articles, I don't remember, um, I, I basically gave the analogy of, you know, you have a spear being hurled against you and uh, you don't destroy the spear because you can't really destroy it. Uh, what you do is that you chip away at it little by little, little by little, until you blunt it to the point that it becomes ineffective. And that's pretty much the analogy of war of corrosion. What you want to do is, you know, you, you trade space if you need to. Um, you let the enemy attack you. Uh, you play very organized, very professional defense, uh, and you just chip away little by little. Uh, the more that you manage to chip away at the at the military, at the Russian military machine, you know, the, the more battalion tactical groups that suddenly become uh, unable to continue combat, and, and you know, if, if their replacement rate is not uh, good enough, then, then you'll be corroding the, the fighting capacity of, of the army until the point where they cannot attack anymore. 
And that kind of happened uh, after a couple of months. And if you think about it, uh, for much of August, there really wasn't many Russian offensives. Because, and, and you sometimes read, you know, this was an operational pause and that'll continue, but there hasn't been a Russian offensive since, uh, in a strategic sense, since, because they are just completely incapable of doing it now. Uh, they would need like a major pause uh, and hope that during this time, Ukraine is not capable of counter attacking them. And what they've done since was basically just fortify, hole up, uh, build trenches and trenches and trenches um but even then um that those pauses have, have made them vulnerable to for example ukrainian artillery long-range artillery strikes which are very precise hitting their ammo depots things like that so what happened during this time ukraine did something that was very good i think from a from a from an operational uh, perspective operational intelligence which was they started hinting uh, very openly this was not a, a secret in any way they were hinting that they were going to recapture harrison which is uh, the only regional capital uh well it's pretty much the the main city uh west of the Dnieper river that they've that the russians have captured and they've been hinting for a while that they want to recapture it so they want to take back the west bank of the Dnieper. uh and so what they've 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 made repeated statements that this was going to be an objective, that they were going to launch an offensive. They've made numerous attacks on, on the bridges, basically, basically making it unable for the Russians to resupply the troops that are on the west bank of the river. Now, the Russians responded to this uh, by reinforcing it. And I remember making a video as well, uh, or, or tweeting about it, that uh, Kherson is probably one of the areas that, at the time, was less defended by by Russian troops. And so it made sense for the Russians to start reinforcing Kherson. Now, the problem with that is, well, you don't have many troops. So they you can't bring new troops into the battle. You have to bring troops from other fronts into the battle. So they started thinning their lines in uh, in other areas of the front, namely around uh, Kharkiv and the Donbass and, and moving troops all the way to Kherson. And then the Ukrainians began their attack. And this started a couple of weeks ago. They started putting pressure. It was, you know, a slow, methodical uh, offensive around uh, around Kherson. Uh, they've, to this point, they've, they've kind of reached, I wouldn't say the outskirts of, of the city. Maybe, maybe, yeah, if you want to, you know, some of the villages or, or settlements that are uh, kind of in the outskirts of, of the capital uh, they have reached there they have gained some territory uh, but most importantly what they've done is basically they've cut off a, a sizable russian army um, in that region so uh what then well uh what if you didn't make this your main strike what if this was just a, a diversion for a bigger strike. And that's exactly what happened. And I'm very, very shocked that Russia didn't see this coming. Now, to be fair, uh, I thought that something was going to happen. I, I, I am immediately skeptical when, when, you know, when someone's announcing that they're going to do something uh, so obviously for weeks on end. Um, I start being a bit skeptical. And the reason I was skeptical is because, to be honest, the West Bank of the Dnieper, uh, by the fact that the crossings have been neutralized, means that it's strategically unimportant. It's psychologically important because, you know, it gives Ukraine a sense of security that they've recovered the area west of the of the river and that they've recaptured uh, Kherson, uh, ideally. But it still doesn't really uh, tell you much. Does it like it doesn't really add much to your longer term because you still need to cross that river if you want to advance further right and do you really want to go into the crimea by crossing a major river first um i don't know so my thought was probably they're planning something uh to the east around zaporizhia which i suspect would give would give uh would give various sort of uh, operational 
um, dilemmas to the Russians on defense. You know, if you if you strike south from from this area of Zaporizhia, uh, are you heading towards Melitopol in Crimea? Are you heading towards Mariupol? Uh, what are you up to? So this gives a defender a, a really hard time, uh, and you ha you also risk of, of just driving towards the coast and essentially splitting the Russian army in two. So I would have assumed that this was where Ukraine was really planning to strike. As it turned out, it was around Kharkiv. And this happened basically, all of this has happened in the last 48 hours. And I just want to show you a great animation of, of, yeah. So there we have a, uh, I'm going to pause it for a sec. So um, I don't know if everyone uh, understands uh, the symbols, uh, the military NATO symbology. So I'm going to just give a quick lecture. Um, the ones with an X are a brigade. That's Ukraine's main, uh, main fighting maneuver unit. Uh, the ones with two lines are battalions. And I don't know if there's a one with a three line. That probably is a regiment. Uh, anyway, the uh, the ones with the little oval here are tanks. The ones with an oval with a cross are mechanized infantry. The ones with just a cross are infantry. Uh, SOF means special forces, special operations forces. And that little sort of looks like a little bird. Um, that's because it's airborne. So those are airborne troops. And this is what happened. They just completely, let's watch it again from the beginning. So clearly spearheaded by some special operations uh, troops. There's a regiment, there's a battalion there. Um, there's a National Guard Brigade. And they just broke through the initial lines and went on a rampage. And they just flooded through the gap, raced in. This is classic textbook Blitzkrieg. I just went all the way to the city of Kupiansk, which is a major transport network. Leave the infantry to mop up the, the defenders that were bypassed, but just immediately, like you don't want to be an army that suddenly is told that you have three brigades to your rear. You don't want to be that army. So this is just massive. Um, they ended up capturing uh, Kubiansk. And I thought, okay, well, this is, this is something. This is not bad. Uh, that's not all. They haven't stopped at Kubiansk. In fact, they've swung around south and they captured Izium as well. And this to me is perhaps the most impressive thing that I've seen so far this war. Russia it took Russia like something like a month to capture Izium. And Izium was inc incredibly important to them because it was it sits on this on this uh, this this line of communication. So it was a very important strategic town. They they sent everything they had against it. Uh took like a month to capture and Ukraine basically took it back in the space of 48 hours. And the reason it was so easy to, to take it is because all these troops have been routed. All these troops are basically retreating. They are fleeing. They, they're, they're, not gonna, they're not standing to fight because you don't want an army behind you. This is why these kind of breakouts are, are so important because no army wants to fight with an army with the opposed opponent behind it. Uh, so they've just fled, given up. I don't know how many prisoners have been captured. Uh, and I don't know, you know, clearly there's, there's a, there's a pocket here that's, that's going to be created. I, I don't know what's going to be the fate of those troops there, but this was just impressive. So Izium captured, uh, I've read that Liman has also been captured. And if you've been following the war, there was also a pretty substantive effort to take Liman, uh, a couple of months ago. And so all these towns were, were just the site of the major Donbass offensive uh, over the summer. Izium, Liman, Severodonetsk, 
for Pazna again. If you followed the, the the news, those names will will surely ring a bell for you. And now two of these, uh, I suspect Briaton is also uh, captured by now. So, yeah, that was absolutely fabulous, absolutely fabulous, and. Here's a, here's a good map that shows why these cities are so important. So Kupiansk right here sits, it's a node in this, uh, it's called G-Lock, Ground Lines of Communication. Uh, so basically all the Russian troops that are in this area of the front uh, depend on those lines of communication and you've just cut them off. So they're fucked. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. They are fucked. And uh, I don't think that there's uh, much that they can do about this. Uh, I don't think they have the, the concentration of power to, to you know, do a, some some kind of Marne-like uh, pincer operation here. Um, I'm sure, uh, you know, the, I'm sure the mechanized and tank units are sort of moving south and trying to cut, you know, close this pocket while the, the northern part is being held by by the infantry. Um, that's what I would do. I think that's what anyone with uh, any sort of military sense would do. Um, now, beyond this, the question is just how extensive is this route? Um, will it affect the uh, the rest of the front? Uh, I still don't know. I don't know. I'm... So far, everything that has happened has vastly exceeded my expectations. Um, but I, I don't want to sound too optimistic. I don't want to give a false sense that this can be sustained uh, for longer. But I, I think we really need to consider the uh, the possibility that, that a route of the Russian army is not inconceivable. And I, and I thought this wouldn't be the case uh, a while back. I definitely thought that it would take at least a bit longer. Um, but at least we've seen it in a relatively an important but limited sector of the front. So anything that happens here can definitely happen anywhere else, I would say. And yeah, so uh, let's look at some of the, uh, yeah, so this is apparently. Izum. Mm -hmm. Ну и троечка там, ССОшная, такое там, СПДшники какие-то там. Техника, блядь, Эршеген. Oh yeah, there's a proof, they are in Izium. Um, lots of abandoned weapons from what I've read. Lots of surrendered troops. There's a very hilarious video. I should have I should have uh, had it here um, of a Russian tank just like fleeing through the streets with you know the Russians on top and just jumping out of the tank and then the tank crashes on a tree. It's it's comical to watch. Um, and I mean I think this is particularly just oh, great. beautiful. Yep, that is indeed what liberation looks like, and this should warm anyone's heart. Uh, this video is interesting because, uh, I mean, I don't speak Russian. Uh, I can't tell the difference when someone's speaking Russian or Ukrainian, but uh, I was been uh, told that the, the the villagers are actually speaking Russian. So... <laughs> So those are apparently the uh, the, the Russian-speaking inhabitants 
of the Donbass that uh, Ви на всяк випадок все посидіть, будь ласка, в підвалі, будь ласка, тому що може бути ще обстріли. Но ми вже тут, вже, вже все добренько. Спасибо, мальчики, спасибо. Ні, там вже все. На саладі залишилися. Будете? Трішечки, трішечки пізніше, трішечки. So, yeah, those are the people who were supposed to be receiving the Russians with with the uh, with open arms. And in fact, here they are uh crying of joy when they've been liberated from Putin. Uh, here's another good one. I really struggle to think how uh, some of these anti-war leftist types can see these videos and be angry about this because they're cheering for Putin. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, this is just beautiful. I mean, this is what you want to see. Uh, you want to see every single town in Ukraine liberated this way uh, and drive these fuckers out for good and hopefully forever. Um, some people, I guess, just uh, don't like the good guys winning. That's all I'm going to say. And what I also like about uh, this offensive is that it happens just when Russia's doing its annual uh, war games. And uh, probably may, may have seen this video as well, but I find it so amusing, just the, the body language. Uh, First of all, Putin looks like he uh, he just sharded on the way to the command post. I mean, look look at look at how he walks. This is then his goons show up. Just look at Garasimov's face. He does not want to be there. This really looked like an army who's winning. By the way, fun fact, uh, Shoigu has never served in the army, uh, the military in general. So he wears military uniforms despite the fact that he has never been in the armed forces. Uh, that tells you everything you need to know about this war machine. Is that the uh, side of an army that's winning? No. And this is just two days before Ukraine's offensive began. So I don't want to know what is going on between these three right now. But, well, um, they started it. That's all, all I'm going to say. And it is their responsibility to end it. Uh, or they're going to get their ass kicked, which I very much hope will happen. Now, as a, some final thoughts, uh, where do I think this is going? You know, can Ukraine win it? Uh, yeah, I think I think this offensive uh, absolutely demonstrates that Ukraine can win this war militarily. And I think the argument that a lot of people on, on the far left and far right have been giving that uh, 
you know, uh, no, 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 I mean, you, Ukraine needs to sue for peace. It needs to give up territory. It needs to, you know, the Chomsky argument that because it can't, it can't win the war realistically. Uh, I think that argument has been categorically debunked this week. I think Ukraine can win militarily. It needs continued support in terms of armament. Um, I think in terms of, you know, popular resolve, I think what the Ukrainian people want is to keep this going, keep this going. Now, how long can they do this? I'm not sure. I think the, the Ukrainian army is still limited in terms of its capacity for uh, sustaining strategic offensives. They're going to need far more trucks than they have, APCs, etc. Uh, right now, if you've, you know, you've, you've seen that in the last couple of months, Ukraine has been pleading for artillery, has been pleading for, for tanks. Um, especially artillery, and, and artillery has definitely made a difference. It's made things like this possible. But for a true strategic offensive that can be maintained for weeks on end, they will need uh, a, a huge amount of trucks, a huge amount of like logistics that uh, I'm not quite sure they have right now. So I have a feeling that's going to be next on their, on their list of, of demands. And I would like to see some air power as well. Uh, I, I would like it if they got uh, some aircraft that were more capable at, you know, being, you know, dual role fighter ground attack stuff. Uh, F-16 is the first thing that would pop into my mind. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to happen. Uh, but anyway, now the big threat right now is obviously winter is coming. Uh, I think any sort of operation offensive operations can definitely continue throughout september maybe for a part of october beyond that it's going to get rough uh, once it starts snowing uh, it's going to get rough and i have a feeling that we're going to sit back and have another winter of just uh, world war one type warfare of just artillery duels uh, going on and just limited gains here and there um and this will be a time for both armies to essentially resupply re-equip uh, remains to be seen whether Russia is going to uh, mobilize more of its society for this war, uh, because at this point there is no real numerical advantage that they have. Uh, so if they really want to keep the war going, they're going to have to bring in more people. Uh, and finally, I, I think in terms of the resupply, Ukraine has a massive advantage in the sense of the equipment that they get is going to be so much better than the equipment that Russia is getting uh, from their warehouses. These are all Cold War stocks of, of old tanks, you know, T-64s, T-62s. Um, I don't know how many are, are operational. No one knows. So they're, they're, the quality of their equipment is just going to get worse and worse and worse, whereas the quality of Ukrainian equipment is going to at least stay similar to what it is now. So... In that respect, Ukraine has a, has a massive advantage. And I think also insofar as they keep the Ukraine keeps its casualties low, um, you know, not back to those 100 or 200 dead a day that you had during the Donbass offensive. On the other hand, I've read that, that Russia lost something like 650 men in one day. I think it was yesterday or close to a thousand. So that is insane. Uh, their worst day of the war by far. So um, I definitely think if you had to bet on it, bet on Ukraine winning. Uh, but this is still not going to be over anytime soon. I don't think the troops will be home by Christmas. This is a long war that will probably only get resolved at some point next year. And in the meantime, I do hope that Ukraine is able to exploit these offensives as much as it can recapture as much territory as it can and i would love it if they had another ace up their sleeve i would love it if they they, they were still planning something else uh you know my original thought of, of them doing some offensive around zaporizhia uh that would be amazing to see if they if they can pull it off and uh, yeah so keep an eye on what's going on around here um also keep an eye on on uh, the situation around uh, Kherson. Uh, but yeah, it's looking good for Ukraine. It's looking really good. So yeah, if you like this video, please like, please share. Most importantly, 
please subscribe to this channel and i will keep doing some updates on the war when uh, when things uh, important things happen if not just follow me on twitter i tweet about the war like god knows how many dozen times a day i share all these videos uh so yeah see you next time Thank <laughs> you.